Okay, good evening. We're going to call the meeting to order at this time. They don't have seats for everyone? We have standing room. There's three seats up front, and there's some seats over here along the, the conference room. And there's some seats up front. Come on, Principal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, everyone, we're so glad to have you here this evening, and I want to say welcome to the Village Council meeting for May 16th, Thursday at 6.30. Um, I know all of our seniors here. Tomorrow is the big day, right? Yeah? Okay. You had your rehearsal and you're ready to go? Okay. So we'll get, we'll get on with this evening. As I said, welcome to the Village Council meeting, and if everyone would stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we begin the agenda this evening, I just want to announce that at the end of the meeting this evening, something that's not on the agenda, but there will be a special uh, sort of an announcement, if you will, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the meeting this evening. So those of you who want to stand, stay around and hear that, please do. Huh? We have to stick around to the end? We have to stick around anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's something special for the citizens of this, of this wonderful village and for the members on this council. So that's my teaser, as they say in the, <laughs> in the news business, right? But this evening, we, we are so uh, glad and, and we welcome to have speak with us tonight and update us um, on the, the latest uh, legislation uh, uh, period had just ended. Before I introduce them, I have to do a little housekeeping. Diane, please let the record show that all members of council are present for the yes, meeting. Please. Okay. Everything has to be recorded, right? But anyway, let's get a warm welcome to uh, State Representative Matt Wilhite, who's going to give us an update on, on what happened up in Tallahassee this last couple of months. Matt, we're so glad that you were able to find some time in your busy schedule to come and give us an update. We've, we've, been, we've been watching with bated breath a lot of the bills that have been going on through the course of the, of the legislative session, so we appreciate any, any insights you can share with us this evening. Well, Mayor, thank you. Uh, Council members, staff, residents, thank you. It's on. Oh, sorry. Now I'll start over. Mayor, Council members, staff members of the community, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, and just give you a little bit about what's happened over the last, uh, this last legislative session. Um, we went about 60 and a half days instead of our standard 60. We had to go a little bit extra because of the budget. Uh, this year we passed about a $91.1 billion budget. Uh, the governor has vowed in his point so far to veto about $100 million. So he wants to keep it around a $90 billion budget for the state of Florida. Um, third largest state in the nation growing a thousand people a day obviously we have a growing population so we're going to have growing needs and so our budget last year was about 88.4 billion dollars so it's it's gone up a little bit but obviously we've had a lot of things that have happened one of the most significant things that we talked about obviously every session has its intricacies uh, was obviously hurricane michael and irma two of the large hurricanes that hit quite a few parts of the north end of the state uh, areas that are still devastated uh, areas that still can't get crops in the ground uh, which is their lifeblood. Uh, cotton, peanuts, things like that are still their lifeblood up in that area, and they just can't get them in the ground because they don't have the funding. The federal government and their uh, great working relationship in Washington, D.C. has not funded any bit of Hurricane Michael to this point. Mm. So um, them not getting along is obviously affecting the state of Florida, and we try to do what we can in our state budget to try and help uh, the, res the residents of, of the panhandle. Uh, some significant legislation I was able to secure, obviously I was... Uh, we get six bills we filed, some local bills. I was able to pass a bill helping Alzheimer's patients. Uh, mm. The Department of uh, Elder Affairs is now going to have to, every three years, come up with a plan and update the governor, the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House of uh, where we are with Alzheimer's disease. We added another memory care facility in Dade County to fund them to try and help Alzheimer's. As many of you know, um, Alzheimer's doesn't affect a population, a party, a sex. It affects everybody equally and 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 so devastatingly, and especially to family members that are the caregivers. So it was really helpful, uh, integral in working with uh, Scott Plakin. His wife died last year of Alzheimer's, and so it's been very close to him as well. And we all probably have someone that either know or has someone that has Alzheimer's that, that it's affecting. Um, 
I believe it's very important. I believe many of our people do. I know that uh, some of the cities are concerned about future costs, but we were able this year to secure something that hasn't happened since 2004 in the state of Florida. We were one of the last states in this nation to give and provide cancer coverage to our firefighters. Uh, two out, uh, the nationwide stand statistic now and proven data in the state of Florida is two out of three firefighters in this, in this country are, for, are stricken with some form of cancer. It's the byproducts of combustion. It's the seats you're sitting on. It's what's in the carpet and, and those different things. It's not the woods and the natural products anymore. It's all the synthetics and all the oils that is in that. And so they are absorbing cancer, uh, absorbing carcinogens and toxins into their body. And uh, unfortunately, they're being stricken with these diseases. And you know, you, I know they work for you, they work for me, but they protect us all. And we wanna make sure that they're able to be, uh, have the best medical coverage and provide it to them to make sure they're taking care of each and every one of us here. And that's all the idea is to try and protect them. If they, it's, there's a lot of barriers in there that make sure that they're five years smoke free. They worked on the job for five different things to make sure, but we wanna put that in place to make sure that we're covering them to protect our communities. Um, passed a local bill for the city of West Palm Beach, their firefighters pension bill, uh, some rule implementation from the PTSD bill that I passed last year. I worked with a representative Casello this year on that. And also uh, something helping our corrections or officers in the state of Florida with a lewd and lascivious act. Uh, to, it was meant to protect uh, corrections officers in prisons. And it was a mistake that they didn't understand that if you went 364 days in the county jail, you weren't covered by this law. So we brought it down to the county jails as well as not just prisons, which is a federal or state issue at 365 days. So just some things there to try and protect against, again, uh, some of our first responders. Uh, we were able to uh, secure about $500,000 for a canal rehabilitation project that you have going. Uh, let's hope that that's not on, the governor doesn't eye that yeah. on his veto pen. Yeah. Uh, we're, well, we, we were able to get it in both budgets on both sides, and so it, uh, it has a better chance then, so it wasn't just one side doing it. Um, and so hopefully that'll help you a little bit there. Uh, we passed a really comprehensive um, um, criminal justice package, uh, and hopefully that's really going to help with a lot of our criminal justice uh, agencies, departments, and help them. Uh, there was some things that were a little concerning. There was a tax plan that was put together, which is a great thing. We offered tax incentives for our residents on holiday tax free, you know, when you're back to schools or hurricanes and, and different things. But there was, a, there was a part of the bill that I really had a problem with, and I really know that all of these residents that voted on it would have hopefully had a problem with it. And it's not the subject matter that bothers me, it's the process that was going about. So last November, we passed by 73% in this state, in this county, uh, that we would offer for four years additional funding for our schools. And it did not include charter schools. It specifically said, does not include charter schools, and there will be oversight used on this money. In this tax plan, in about, I don't know, line 7,000, they added a line that said any taxes that were levied against the residents would now have to be shared equally with any charter schools in the area. And that's okay. I'm not questioning charter schools. The problem is it was going to override your vote that you did just this last November, and I don't think that's right. And so thank goodness we were able to amend it and change it at the end of the day that now it will be going forward instead of backwards. So any future levies will include charter schools, but they should not go back against the will of the voters. That was specific language, and I'm sure your attorney would agree, that any language that's that specific, and, and we've told the residents and we've asked them to vote on this, and they voted overwhelmingly on this and passed, that it should be uh, going forward and not backwards. Um, what else? Uh, I will tell you there's something that I was not really, and I, I, this is just a philosophical thing. Uh, we passed legislation last year that talked about our schools and safety, and we talked about um, you know, uh, making sure we had more barriers in our schools and protecting them and, and different things and more resource officers. And this county has done a lot of work to put resource officers in every school now. They continue to hire resource officers and grow their agency to protect our students. But something we did this year uh, is we allowed now teachers to carry guns in schools. I philosophically don't think it's the right thing. I have two kids in public school. I have one in fourth grade and one in sixth grade. The day that we debated it on the floor of the Florida House of Representatives, a school resource officer, a very well-trained person, accidentally discharged his gun in the cafeteria in a school in, Flo in Florida. Yep. Now, that could have been any teacher in a classroom. It could have been any person. The more guns we put in schools, and again, I know the resource officer is trained and accidents happen, but we need to try and limit them. And the problem I really have, those, have with it is the state is more willing to, uh, to give a teacher back $500 for purchasing a gun than giving them $500 worth of supplies to put in their classroom. 
because I know that I have to buy school supplies for my two kids every year that we go, and now the teachers have to, and they won't reimburse them for supplies, but they'll reimburse them for a gun they're gonna purchase to have. Now there's a lot of training in place. I know they're gonna have to do that. A lot of, there's not a lot of recurrency as much. There's not a lot of psychological evaluation going on and stuff, but some of those other things concern me about what we're doing. Yes, Mayor. Yeah, just a clarification. That now, th does that law give discretion to local school districts? It does. To move it, forward? It's not, they're not compelled to do it. They just passed a law that says they can do it. Correct, okay. correct. Uh, it used to be that it had to be the sheriff and the school superintendent. Now it only has to be one of them. Okay. Um, and so it does still give the opportunity for you to opt out of it. There have already been many counties in the state that have said they will opt out of it. Um, I'm hoping that ours opts out of it. And I'm not saying that I'm not worried about our school, the safety of our children. Yeah. I fight every day to try and f get funding and sort resources and help our school board and work with our school police chief and stuff. But I just believe that teachers should be teaching, they should be nurturing, they should be mentoring, they should be counseling, they should be feeding, and obviously they should be guiding the minds of our young children, not worrying about protecting them with a gun or having to fly around the, uh, the school with another classroom to another classroom and leave their students to worry about uh, uh, someone that's on the school campus. We need to do more on the perimeter to keep them out. You know, your role at Palm Beach High School right down here, I went there one day. One way in, one way out. There's someone standing at the gate. They have a they have a tent over them, keep, and they have radios, and they should not let anybody on that campus. And the campus is entirely locked up except that one gate. That's what should we should be fighting for: getting in and keeping them out is the issue. Not once they're on campus. I'm hoping so. Uh, that is something I wasn't really excited about. Uh, there's some other stuff that I'm really concerned about that's coming. And again, I'm not philosophically philosophically getting into it, but we did some stuff with federal immigration and sanctuary cities. And I guess just recently now, the federal government has announced that they're gonna be sending around the country a lot of um, undocumented immigrants after they process them. And we might be getting a lot here, right here in Palm Beach County. And I think it's a federal issue. And the federal issue is not happening again. Remember I talked about those people in Washington that aren't really talking and working together. And now they're still not <laughs> fixing the problem and now they're putting the burden on us. And I'm not sure there's gonna be funding. You may have to allocate funding out of your taxpayers to, to go to this when it should be a federal issue. So that's something at the state level we, we started to talk about, and now the feds are starting to push it down, I think, on us a little more. So that's a little concerning, I think, as well. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of transportation stuff happening. Um, the problem with a lot of the transportation stuff that, that's being talked about is not around this area. And I know many of you drive Southern Boulevard, and you know the population that's growing out here. Um, I really tried to fight to get a uh, Highway 27 corridor project into the bigger package that was out there. Uh, they didn't agree to it. Sitting on the governor's desk right now, we're going to find out what he's going to do with those three new toll roads that are going to go in the western central part of the state. Um, but I'm really still trying to get that part in out here because our roads right here are already overloaded. They need help. Um, as you see, Southern Boulevard's been worked on for how long now, and it doesn't seem like they've gotten anywhere so far. Um, but we continue to try and fight. And you know, some of that comes back right here at your level too, and I've said this to many of you individually, is how much we improve and permit here affects everywhere else too. So a lot of cities around this area that are doing that, it's gonna affect a lot of it. And frankly, the state and the federal government has not kept up with a lot of the transportation needs as well as you know the things you can do here at the local level. So it, it takes longer for them to Southern Boulevard to happen. So uh, that's just a few things. I mean, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. I would like to uh, obviously, rep uh, my staff back here, I'd like to recognize them. Melissa Santora on the left and Tom Valley on the right. They have some uh, flyers. Uh, we have a mail out that we send out, uh, email list we put out. We send you fly, uh, a monthly mail list during session. We send it to you weekly. And so we'll continue to do that. So if you wanna sign into that, that we try and communicate the things that are happening uh, each and every week in Tallahassee or every month when we're not there. Uh, they've already set committee schedules for next year. So September, we'll already start going back up there for seven weeks to, to start working on the next legislative session and filing bills. I absolutely think the most important pieces of legislation that I file are from you or any one of you. If there's anybody has any ideas of things that they don't think are working, or that they think could be changed, over 3,000 bills were filed this year and only 196 passed. We should make it difficult to change your life, but if there is something significantly impacting your life that you feel like we can change, that's the most important thing that I think I have the ability to work on is to try and change that for anyone here. So that communication that we try to get to you or we can do for anybody, uh, we would obviously uh, absolutely do. Our office is right here on Belvedere and Royal Palm Beach, just east of 441. Uh, so please, anybody, if you want to stop by, email, call us, please feel free. And thank you for the opportunity. Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions or anything if you had any. Well, we thank you. Great. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Representative Wilhite, thank you so much for your presentation. It's always good to hear the results of your work in Tallahassee. And, and definitely thank you for um, 
advocating for our canal project. We really appreciate that. My question is, um, with regard to the cuts that the governor wants to, do you have any insight as to what areas he's looking at? I do not. Uh, I would hope it's not the areas that he had that were seriously uh, asking for, whether it be environmental things. He was asking for $650 million. I think he, he got more than that, so I doubt it'll be somewhere in there. I would imagine, uh, as you saw, he did veto a, a, a pretty substantial bill that was impacting local government that he said had no statewide impact that he shouldn't have to worry about. So he the, uh, the ban on straws and the sunscreens and all that different stuff that local governments <clears throat> have the ability to control what happens in your backyard. So I, I really have no idea where he's going to veto, but I'm, I'm guessing, as he's already publicly said, somewhere around $100 million he's going to cut. Thanks. <clears throat> anyway, thank you. Anyone else? No? no? Well, thank you very much again. Well, we and, thank you, uh, sir, for coming by, <clears throat> Representative Royal Hyde, and thank you for the work you did for the, hopefully it doesn't get vetoed, the funds that are heading to Royal right. Palm Beach. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but continue to, to do the good work you're doing for the citizens here. We All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, tonight is, uh, we're good? Graphic, we're good? Oh, okay, I thought he was talking. He's <laughs> mumbling. He's mumbling? <laughs> Don't, it's too early for that. We, we still got a lot of meeting to do. Trying to get okay. 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 Um, tonight's one of those happy nights where we get to recognize one of our uh, fabulous uh, members of, of the staff here in the village of Royal Palm Beach. And tonight, we will recognize 20 years of service uh, for Todd Wax. Todd Wax has served. Yeah. Todd, as he's better known, has served the village of Royal Palm Beach for 20 years. He was hired in 1999, where he served as the village electrician in public works. His first projects were the pavilions at Challenger Park, the remodel of Camilla Park, and the in-house electric service of the field operations center. In 2001, he transferred to the building department as an electric, electrical inspector where he performed in-progress inspections for Booming Madison Green, Bella Terra, Victoria Groves, and many other developments within the village. In 2004, Todd returned to the public works to be the electrical superintendent. In this role, he provided his electrical, exp electrical ex expertise to many in-house projects, such as the ball field lighting at Ferron Park, the new lighting at ball fields four, six, seven, and eight, uh, and parking lots at Bob Marcello Park. Todd is sitting there going, gee, I don't remember those projects. <laughs> <laughs> Todd was instrumental in bringing the village through Hurricane Irene, Francis, Jean, and Wilma. We all remember those, don't we? In 2007, Todd returned to community development where he currently coordinates the building department's plan review and serves the village as the electrical and building inspector and electrical building plan reviewer. As Todd has said, time flies when you're having fun. You must be having a lot of fun, sir. Todd has proven to be a valuable asset to our village team and continues to hold the needs of our residents as the highest priority. We hope to have Todd to continue with us at least another 100 years. Well done, <laughs> sir. Thank you.
Okay. What you've all been waiting for. Yeah, now what you have been waiting for. Why are so many people here tonight, such, 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 so many young, smiling, energetic, our future, all right, are here with us tonight. And we're here to do our annual recognition and presentation of uh, scholarship awards. For those of you who participated in this, obviously you went through the rigor. Um, you, you, you had the requirements that, that had to be met. And tonight, we wanted to share with you and your family and, 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 share, and give you this, this award for your excellence. And we hope you continue to do that going forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Councilman uh, Hamera, uh, who is the liaison to our Education Advisory Committee. And all the Education Advisory Committee members that are here tonight, I want to thank you for the time and diligence you put in. I know it's not an easy task every year. We have so many outstanding students that come before you. It's a challenge to figure out, you know, will it down to the, to the 10 awards that we want to give. So we thank you for your time, your effort, and your passion on this. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and so since we're talking about the Education Advisory Board members, can I get them all to just stand for a moment? And let's thank them for doing an outstanding job. Throughout the year, this was kind of the culmination of, of the year's activities, and it's probably the most fun part, although hearing each one of the schools come and do their own presentations is, is really enjoyable, and I want to congratulate them on doing such a great job. Each one of them had at least one school to engage with, and they took it on seriously, and, and I think the schools appreciate it, and I think we learned something from it. So, But the most enjoyable task and most challenging task is to go through a long list of, of candidates, of applicants, and then pick out the 10 recipients. And so without further ado, let me just start off by congratulating all of you, as well as all of the applicants. That was a great thing for you all to step up and take advantage of an opportunity here, which just is part of a demonstration of who you are and what you're gonna be doing in the future, I'm sure. So let's begin with the first recipient. And when I call your name, if you'd step on up, stand next to the mayor, then we're gonna have one of the Education Advisory Board members read your uh, biography, very brief one that talks about your accomplishments, and then he will present you with the uh, the check. So uh, the first recipient is Anthony Benedict. from Royal Palm Beach High School. He has had an amazing high school career and has enjoyed every second of it. He was student body vice president of student council and a member of the PBSO Explorers program. Now that he's finishing up high school and getting ready to graduate, he's preparing for the next step in his journey, which is attending UCF. Going to college has always been a goal of his and now is coming true. He has been preparing since elementary school to go to college, and once that goal is complete, he wishes to come back to Royal Palm Beach and join the PBSO as a deputy. He would like to thank the village of Royal Palm Beach County for supporting him on his endeavors, and he hopes to return the favor after college. Congratulations. Our next, our next recipient is Star Bianami. Did I pronounce that last name right? Was it close? Okay, thank you. Star Ebony Bianami is a Haitian American female graduating from the first class of IB diploma candidates at Royal Palm Beach High School. Her favorite. Right. Her favorite subject is science, but more so ecology. She enjoys playing sports such as basketball and also enjoys being active in gym. Some of her favorite hobbies include taking care of younger children, like her one month old nephew, roller skating at Atlantis, and spending time with her mommy. 
Based off her love for children and her childhood experiences, she's decided to share that love and care she's received by majoring in biomedical sciences at USF in hopes of becoming a pediatrician. Her life hasn't always been the easiest, but because she has had the best of teachers, Mrs. Lawrence and Mrs. Boyd, as well as friends, she has made connections with people who've done nothing less than motivate her to become the best star she can be. She hopes that one day she can motivate children the way others have motivated her and always keep the best foot forward. A message she'd like others to know is, I know that life will not always be smooth. I have experienced some of those bumpy roads, but as long as we stay true to ourselves, there's nothing we can't get through. Congratulations. Our next recipient, uh, Madeline Crean, unfortunately was not able to be here this evening, but we're going to go ahead and read her bio anyway. Yeah, because she's at another awards ceremony, which is what all these young people do. So uh, Madeline is uh, graduating from Wellington High School with a Cambridge ACE diploma. She's an AP student, is the president of the Wellington High School National Science um, Honor Society, and was a captain of her high school swim team. Madeline believes providing opportunities to those who are less fortunate. She recently came back from Cuba on a mission trip there where she connected with teams and helped build you know, connections between the US and the teens that are there. She'll be attending the State University of New York in Oswego, where she'll be majoring in meteorology. It's one of the two schools in the entire country, and she got in. So that says a lot. And we certainly could use a meteorologist here, Mayor, don't you think? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> her goal is to be a chief meteorologist and to study tornadoes and hurricanes. She hopes to one day make it possible to predict them before they become disastrous. She'll also be swimming for the Oswego State on a destination Oswego scholarship. So a big hand for Miss Madeline Crean. She's a wonderful young lady. Our next recipient is Maya Gardner. Maya Gardner is a graduating senior from Royal Palm Beach High School and is the daughter of Rohan and Angel Gardner and the sister of Madison Gardner. Maya has been a very active member in her school by being president of National Honor Society and vice president of Future Educators of America and captain of the girls' tennis team. Maya is also part of her school's ch school chapter's DECA club and competed in DECA states earlier this year. Not only has Maya competed in DECA, but she also has competed at tennis district and state championships. She was the first girl in Royal Palm Beach High School's history to win girls tennis singles at districts and was the only person to represent her high school at states. Not only is Maya involved with extracurricular activities at school, but she also has been tackling rigorous classes since her freshman year of high school. Maya was able to stay on honor roll for her entire high school career and has obtained a GPA of 3.88 and an HPA of 5.03. Maya has enjoyed all her teachers and administration at Royal Palm Beach High School and is glad that she will be graduating as a wildcat. After graduating high school, Maya will be attending the University of Florida where she will be majoring in biology and taking a pre-med track. Maya's future career plans are to be an obstetrician gynecologist and provide care for women who cannot afford the proper medical aid. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next recipient is Kate Collard Dye.
Kate Collar Dye graduated in the top 3% of her class at Royal Palm Beach High School. She served over 500 community service hours throughout the past four years. She is active in many clubs, including National Honor Society, Future Educators of America, DECA, and Key Club. She's president of Spanish Honor Society, as well as president of the club that she's most passionate about, My Fair Ladies. This club focuses on empowering young women in the community. Kate is very excited to be continuing her academic and athletic career at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where she has committed to play soccer and major in nutrition and dietetics. Congratulations. Our next recipient is Marco Perrick. Marco is 18 years old and is currently a senior at Palm Beach Central High School's engineering program. His hobbies are drumming, programming, cycling, and playing video games. He will be attending UCF in the fall as part of their honors program. He plans to dual major in computer science and computational mathematics. Congratulations. Our next recipient is John Mark Andrew Phillips. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here this evening, but we're going to read his bio. John Mark Phillips has lived in the Royal Palm Beach area all his life. He attends Seminole Ridge High School and is a full-time dual enrollment student at Palm Beach State College. He has participated in the Florida State Science and Engineering Fair for four years and has earned numerous awards for his research from organizations such as the American Chemical Society and United States Navy. He is currently participating in the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, presenting his work on nanotechnology <laughs> and high throughput drug discovery. Yeah. <laughs> Our next recipient is Nicole Taylor. <laughs> Nicole Taylor is graduating senior at Royal Palm Beach High School. She has maintained an overall 3.8 GPA, a 4.0 GPA for the 2018-19 school year. Nicole has spent time participating in Theater Club, JROTC, and the Department of Defense Education Activity Student to Student Ambassadors Club. Nicole also has over 500 hours of community service. She has volunteered at schools, churches, and soup kitchens. Nicole takes pride in being adopted. She is a big sister and she enjoys spending time with her family. Nicole enjoys helping others and will be pursuing this joy by majoring in hospitality management at Florida Gulf Coast University. Congratulations. There's 85 family members here, just so you know. So you <laughs> Our next recipient is Steph okay. Stephanie Vasilotti. Before I read this essay, because um, I need you to understand, you make my job really hard as a board, and we'd like more money next year so we can give more scholarships because <laughs> these people are going to change the world. And I, they were amazing to know we have, we're in good hands. And Stephanie's enjoyed living in rural Palm Beach ever since she was two years old. And this is a big thing I want everybody in this room to understand. She's a proud person and a product of rural Palm Beach public schools. 
She came all the way to Cypress Trails Elementary, Crestwood Middle, and finally Rural Palm Beach High School. Uh, apart from our school system, this community has given her so much more, such as an opportunity to play recreational sports like soccer, tennis, and cheerleading. Stephanie participated in Pop Warren and cheer team for about six years and was honored to be part of the first Rural Palm team to make it all the way to nationals. She loves to be involved in as many activities as possible. She feels that by joining teams and a part of the various clubs allows her to meet new people, discover her interests, and find a passion. Over the years, Stephanie has found that some true passions in life come from helping others and being someone that people can look up to. She is grateful that while being a Wildcat, she was able to achieve many goals that she'd set for herself. For example, Stephanie joined the varsity cheerleading team, the National Honor Society, and the Interact Club. And not only did she join these extracurriculars, but she decided she wanted to be a leader of them. So finally, by her senior year, she accomplished being historian and vice president of the National Honor Society, president of the Interact Club, and co-captain of the Royal Palm sideline and competitive cheerleading teams. During the course of four years, and I can't believe you did this in four years, Stephanie, just so you know, she's able to accumulate over 50 college credits. Right, and it takes 60 to get an associate's degree, so she's almost two years in already. And over 500 community service hours, ladies and gentlemen, and still maintain a 5.2 GPA. Stephanie is proud to say she will be graduating as number four in her class. Thanks to all her incredible teachers and administration during her time in these schools, she feels confident she's now ready to conquer college. Stephanie would like to thank the Village of Royal Palm Beach for helping to make her dream of attending the University of Central Florida possible, where she plans to study actuarial science. And she had to explain that to us too, so just so you know. Congratulations again. And our final recipient is Maura Catherine Wilson. Maura Wilson, a student of Alexander W. Dreyfus Junior School of the Arts, has experienced experience in theatrical lighting, set, and sound design, and has led theatrical crews, sharing her knowledge of technical theater with other students. She has been able to share theater with her surrounding community through theater for young audiences and sensory-friendly shows for Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. She also volunteered her time with the Waltz Jupiter Theater Young Artist Chair production of To Kill a Mockingbird. She is a part of several honor societies and was inducted into the International Thespian Society her freshman year of high school. She plans to focus on set and lighting design and earn a BFA in theater production at the University of Florida and continuing to give back to her community through theater. I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I think the young people coming up who are going to be taking over this country and running this country going forward, I think the country is going to be in really good shape with kids like you coming up. So thanks again for being here tonight. Let's give them another wonderful round of applause. We're so proud of you. I know we have the, the proud parents, grandparents, uh, siblings, uh, all members of the family that are here tonight. Uh, we, sell to, we say to all of you, well done because here's a product of your efforts that you see before you. So thank you again. Uh, those of you who want to remain at the meeting, please do. Those of you who want to depart, I'm going to have a two minute recess so that you can leave quietly if you choose to do so. But thank you all for coming tonight and have a wonderful, wonderful summer and hit those books again when you start college. So we're going to recess for about two minutes.
Transportation Planning Agency uh, meeting and a couple of items that I think are relevant that I'd like to share with the council and with members of the, of the village. We got a report or a presentation from our staff consultant <clears throat> uh, on our long range transportation plan update. Now the key <laughs> to this update uh, that included something called multimodal desires plan and in that desires plan there was something that was included called uh, transit desire services with actual proposed projects and I'm really excited about that because you heard me talking about it and you've heard uh, some of the members on council talking about this whole issue of uh, the transportation planning focus being so focused on building more lanes for more cars. We all know there's traffic, traffic, traffic. Right? It's, it's, there's always been a reality. But what we've been trying to do is take a different view at this, this issue of how to get rid of the traffic is to give people reasons not to drive their cars. Give them trans other transportation options and solutions that they will say, I don't have to take my car to get from point A to point B. I can take mass transit because it is more readily available. In particular, where we are here in, in uh, Royal Palm Beach being a western community entity, our focus really has been can we increase transportation opportunities going on what we call the east-west corridor. Can we get to the, from, from the west to the east without having to drive and vice versa. The reason why I bring that up is because today's announcement and, and presentation actually includes concrete plans to begin addressing that. Um, there were six corridors that they call east-west corridors that they chose. The ones that are more that are applicable to our region, to us, is the for, for Forest Hill, coming all the way from uh, State Road 7, back all the way to U U.S. Highway 1, um, Okeechobee Boulevard, and State Road 7, and th there's some uh, and Lake Worth Lake Worth Road. So we got those three roads, and you got the the north-south corridor with State Road 7, with connecting that. There are actual plans that were included now, or going to be included in a long-term, long-range uh, transportation plan that will begin addressing this. And it's really what I would like to call the first major step of kind of moving us in a different direction and actually coming up with some concrete potential scenarios to address this east-west corridor issue. So I'm, I'm very happy to he see that presentation today and the fact that it is going to be incorporated in our long-range planning model for TPA. I will absolutely keep you posted because this is just the first step and many, many, many steps that will have to come down the road. But you can't, you know, you can't get to second base without going to first base first. So um, we, <laughs> a little baseball metaphor, right? So I'm, I'm very happy to report that, that we're moving forward with that. Um, I also want to include in this that Although these, this initial uh, uh, planning on these corridors brings it out to State Road 7, um, which is really to our border, uh, our, our eastern border, it does also address the fact that there has to be additional extended transportation options from State Road 7 to the Glades region. So we're not forgetting about the further west, westward uh, side of things. And as I said, this is the first major step and it is a major step, I think, in the right direction. When I'm asked the question about what are we doing by traffic, about traffic, my response is we have to come up with solutions that will let you decide you don't need to drive your car to get to where you want to go. And that's what we have to pursue. So I'm glad to report that this evening. Uh, the, we've been talking about it now for about a year or so, the, the transition of the TPA uh, becoming independent. A key piece of that transition is the completion of their new office space because they're moving out of the county offices into their own offices. They uh, announced today that construction was, in fact, moving forward. And there's a target date of September of this year of them actually moving in. Now, that's the target, and hopefully that nothing happens to interrupt that, but that's the current plan. Uh, there was information shared with us that there's legislation regarding autonomous vehicles in the state of Florida, HB 311. And what's interesting about this legislation, and I'm not sure of the status, I think, and I'm not sure if it was something that was introduced that's still being looked at or is it something that's going to the governor's desk. But the point of this was that it fully authorized autonomous vehicles without a human operator. Now, it, it, when we talk about AVs, we always assume it's a vehicle where nobody's driving it. But, but there was, from a, from a legal standpoint, there was ambiguity around, well, does that mean somebody doesn't have to sit behind the wheel even though they're not driving it? Or does it mean there's nobody 
behind the wheel, they're just the passengers in the vehicle. Apparently this law is setting out to put some clarification around that, so I want us to stay tuned to this and see what does this really mean as it progresses. I interpret it to mean that it, it just states by law you can have autonomous vehicles operate with no one behind the wheel, whereas now it is questionable, so <clears throat> interesting. Um, we also appointed our annual strategic planning subcommittee. Uh, the purpose of the subcommittee for the TPA is to come up with recommendations for the full board on next year near, near term st uh, strategic uh, directions and, and, uh, and requirements or accomplishments for the TPA. I'm glad to say I'm once again a member of that, that board as well. So with that, I think we have to start with the rest of the reports with you. Yeah. I'll be quick and painless. Good evening, everyone. We had a recreation advisory board meeting, um, and we did a, a reorganization as well. So our new chair is Carlton Brooks, and our vice chair is John Rufa. So congratulations to them. We talked about the sporting center renovations that are going to be taking place over the next three months, and then that's that third floor, so that that'll be finished. Uh, security cameras going into several parks, including Katz, Farron, and Bob Marcello over the next year. And then the following year would be Robner and the Rec Center. Our summer programs, check out, there is a great calendar on our website now with that, that they uh, passed out the information. And there are also summer camps and art camp as well to register for. The Young at Heart has 395 members. Their final lunch is on Friday, June 7th and they do have a trip to Sarasota, and the Senior Expo is set now for July 19th, and that's gonna be back over at the Cultural Center. And don't forget we have our slogan competition, so it's a new village slogan, it is due. If you go online, you can register for it and submit your, app, your um, suggestions by May 30th. I would like to thank Kathy Drehaus for her uh, 15 years of service to the village, so she recently retired, and I like to refer to her as, uh, I wanted to say thank you for her being my village mom, so she always made oh. sure that we were in, w taken care of and we had everything. Like we were all uh, attended the Cultural Diversity Day that we had over the weekend, and thank you to CAFSI for doing that with us as well. We do have our Citizen Summit coming up on Monday, May 20th. It's at 6.30 at the Cultural Center, and all are welcome to attend, so please give us your input. And finally, we have our Memorial Day event on May 27th. It's at 9 a.m. at Veterans Park. Thank you. Very good. Okay, Richard. Only report is um, like like the event tonight last. I think it was well, not this past one, but the one before uh, Saturday night. CAFSI had its annual um, giving of the scholarships as well, and uh, it was you know just like tonight. A lot of great applicants and great to see a bunch of young people going forward with their education and you know really involved in the community and getting uh you know recognized for it and getting some financial assistance because college isn't cheap that's for sure thank you that's all mr mayor jeff you ready <laughs> i'm ready no report mr mayor <laughs> okay thank you sir <laughs> stop it <laughs> Jan. <laughs> Selena, thank you for um, making our reports. No reports. <laughs> <laughs> you cover all the bases. Oh, yeah. You cover all the bases. Yeah. Yep. Right. Thank you for all the extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Aww. Wow. We love you. I, I just want to say next Wednesday we're gonna we're gonna be celebrating the induction of one of our own as president of, League of Palm Beach County League of Cities, Jeff Armer. Uh, next Wednesday, so looking forward to that opportunity and, and that and that that luncheon. Thank you. We'll all be there. I'm, we will be there. I'm counting on it. Okay. I do have a report tonight. Oh, yes, you do. don't. Yes. I know. Sorry. So I'll take the time Ray did not use. <laughs> okay. Now I'll do these fast. I have two things I want to update you all on. Um, at the last council meeting, we were talking about uh, the timing of the special election for the charter amendment on term lengths. Since that time, uh, Wendy Link, the new supervisor of elections, sent out um, correspondence to all of the city clerks and said, um, she was sorry, but she's not going to be able to accommodate anybody for special elections this year with the timing of getting new election equipment and testing that equipment. It's just not going to be feasible. So I talked to Diane about, you know, what are we going to recommend to you all? 
we would like to recommend having and working towards um, having that special election in August of 2020. We thought the August 2020 special election was a, a good time to do this type of a question. Um, as you all remember at strategic planning, we had talked about the, the March election is gonna be the presidential preference primary and that those are traditionally very long ballots. We do, this is such an important question to the residents. You all did not wanna have ballot fatigue. So with okay. that, we are just looking for direction from you to work with the SOE for the August 2020 election on that question. You need a consensus? If I, can, consensus is fine, okay. yes, on this. Are you okay with that? Okay. Good. You have okay. a unanimous consensus? Yes, all right. Okay. <laughs> well, voted, so. obviously, the, as yeah, we said, the, 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 the SOE agreement would come back <laughs> to you and the ordinance on. comes <laughs> back <laughs> to you. Like, right. Thanks, okay. Thank you. It's, it's a busy times ahead. Absolutely. Yes. And then the other thing um, I wanted to bring up with you all, um, <laughs> as Representative <laughs> Wilhite said, the legislative session, they're, they've been very busy this year. Um, this was no exception. Uh, oh. We What's dodged. We dodged quite a few really, really bad bills, but some did make their way through. And the one I'm about to talk to you about is not, it's not horrible, it's just something that we're going to have to address. Um, back in November, you all passed your new landscaping code. And this year, the legislature decided to take some of your authority to regulate tree trimming away from you, even though I don't quite understand how that's a state concern. Um, but with that being said, uh, House Bill 1159 was uh, passed by the House and Senate. It was finally passed by the House on April 26th. It has been sent to the governor for signature. Um, I checked today, he has not signed it yet, but it's expected that he will be signing this one. Um, and what it does is for residential properties, they don't define residential properties, so we're gonna have to take that in a broad meaning, meaning anything residentially zoned. So whether it's owned by you know, a, a homeowner or owned by an HOA or a commercial residence, I think we're gonna have to take a broad view of that. So for any residential property, um, that property owner is not required to get a permit with the village pay any fee or replace a tree that is removed if a landscape architect or a certified arborist says the tree had to be trimmed or had to go because it posed a danger to people or property. Um, that conflicts somewhat with your new landscaping code and then it conflicts in the sense of um, danger to property our code already uh, had an exception in it. You don't have to get a vegetation removal permit to remove or trim a tree if it's a danger to vertical construction, so buildings. Uh, danger to property is broader than that, so we're gonna have to revise our code to kind of address that more broad sense of what we mean by property. But the biggest, the biggest conflict that we have with our new code is about the tree replacement and the mitigation requirements. Um, under this new law, if uh, arborist or a landscape architect tells a property owner, hey, you can go ahead and remove this because it's a danger to person or property. We can't make them put that tree back in. And as you remember, that's a big change from what your code says. So with that all being said, um, I, I, I'm asking for a recommendation tonight, and I'm gonna read very specifically what I'm recommending, and then if you all agree, I'm gonna make it easy and just say so moved as stated by the attorney, <laughs> so you don't have to repeat this, because it is very, very specific. Um, a lot of your tree trimming requirements are coming into effect on June 5th, so we're gonna, we're gonna modify, I'm asking to modify this slightly tonight. So what I am asking for is a, a motion and a vote to postpone the enforcement of hat racking, tree abuse, and new tree trimming standards, and the tree replacement mitigation requirements until Ordinance 945 is amended to address the new House bill. The postponement shall only apply in the following circumstances. If a tree is pruned, trimmed, or removed on residential property, the property owner provides the village with documentation from a certified arborist or floral licensed landscape architect that the pruning trimming or removal was necessary because the tree presented a danger to persons or property and the property owner obtained such documentation prior to the pruning trimming or removal so if i could have direction to give to staff to postpone that enforcement in this way you're saying they have to get the documentation before they remove the tree right you don't pull it out and then go find your friend the arborist and say oh, oh it was yeah. cool to do that 
But right. when, we don't want. But at what yes. point do they have to present that information to the village after most, it's removed? Right. Most likely, it's going to happen because code enforcement will notice a tree is gone, or a neighbor will complain that somebody's trimming a tree. Or that that's probably how it's going to happen. Honestly, that's how we catch most landscaping violations yeah, now. Exactly. My only question was: is since we do have an arborist on staff or available, can it be our arborist, or does it have to? Do they can find anybody? It would be a private arborist because your vendor. We don't have. We you all have not budgeted the funding to be responding to private property requests in that way. Okay. And we will be bringing back a code change to you all probably in the next three months to address all of this. It's just going to have to go through TSR and LPA and make its way back up to you. Just going back to that point, though, even if, if we decided to budget funding to, to staff that, it, it would really be appropriate to have the village making that call? I don't think I, what, is there a possibility of them accusing us of being biased? Yes, and yes, and we, we want to so we 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 stay out of it. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably but sure. as of right now, you don't even have a mechanism know, where. Right. You have an arborist that would I'm do that. I'm just curious. On the other side of this, though, is there a chance that this a cottage industry of I'm pretty sure that's what's well, going you know, to happen. Certification folks out there to Your do your hired this? hired experts, hired yeah, guns. Right. Yeah, so, I'm, that's okay. probably going to happen. But our job is to put as many protections into the code, you know, to make sure things like you need to get this letter from your arborist before you take the tree out, so that they're you know kind of um, try to lessen some of that if we can. Okay, so I, I do need a motion and a vote on this because we are extending an ordinance deadline that's coming up June 5th for residential properties only. So we're extending it three months. I didn't put a date. You didn't on put here. a date until, so completed. until it's implemented. Until, until it's implemented. Until it's implemented. Okay, all right. So we're looking for a motion that would would uh, move on all of your recommendations in their entirety. Yes, please. I'll make so that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? You know, opposed, Diane, please let the record show that the requested recommendations uh, from uh, 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 council, uh, legal council, was approved 5-0. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. That's it? Okay. I think that concludes our reports this evening. <clears throat> right now, if there's anyone here who has a petition they'd like to present to the council, now would be the time to present that petition. Seeing none, I'm closing uh, acceptance of petitions this evening. I do not have any comment cards uh, or statements from the public on non-agenda items or items on a consent agenda. But if anyone would like to comment on a non-agenda item right now or an item on a consent agenda, I invite you up at this time. Seeing none, then I'm closing public comment on non-agenda items or items on a consent agenda. And with that, Diane, can you give us a consent agenda? Yes, Mayor, thank you. Number one, approval of the minutes of the council regular meeting of April 18th, 2019. Two, approval and authorization in accordance with established policy to make a budget amendment for Fund 302 in the fiscal year 2018-2019 budget. Said amendment to transfer a total of $20,000 from RV Boat Parking to EN18004 to Customer Service Area Renovation BD1802. Three, approval and authorization for the village manager to execute an addendum to extend geotechnical and environmental engineering services provided by Terracon consultants for two years. Four, approval of bid award and authorization for the village manager to enter into an agreement with Custom Tree Care Incorporated, the lowest responsive responsible bidder in the amount of $726,175 for debris removal services. Okay, are there any comments from members on council on the consent agenda? If there are none, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that all, mem all items on the consent agenda were approved 5-0. Yes, ma'am. All right, this evening on our regular agenda, our regular agenda item number one is a public hearing and first reading of ordinance number 887 and application number 17-71. An application by Cutler and Harry. The applicant is seeking a small scale future land use map amendment to change the use designation for a parcel of land totaling approximately 5.55 acres from the open space future land use designation to the general commercial <coughs> land use designation located as one zero, at 10701 Okeechobee Boulevard. Bradford. Great, thank you, Mayor. 
Um, as you stated, the applicant is, is seeking a small-scale comprehensive plan amendment um, to change the future land use designation of 5.55 acres of land from the open space future land use designation to the commercial future land use designation. The site is currently vacant. The applicant has indicated in their justification statement that the ultimate goal is to develop the property to operate in conjunction with the First Baptist Church or the Connect Church to the west. This parcel of land is currently part of the capstone at Royal Palm Platte. This parcel of land was previously owned by the village and was transferred to Royal Palm Beach SLP LLC on December 29, 2017. The parcel was subsequently um, transferred to the First Baptist Church of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, Inc. on December 31, 2018. And the idea in 2017 was that this property would become part of the church's property and the future land use designation is only to be changed consistent with the First Baptist Church current commercial future land use designation and general commercial zoning district. Um, in reviewing the comprehensive plan, village staff considered consistency of the proposed changes of elements of the comprehensive plan, consistency with the vision for the future of the village, compliance with state law, whether the action request will exacerbate any existing public facility capacity deficits, as it relates to traffic circulation element, solid waste, drainage, um, the proposed land use amendment package is consistent with the requirements of Chapter 163 of Florida statute concerning the requirements for processing future land use amendments. Overall, the proposed site is in conformance with the village's requirements for the commercial future land use designation. All future submittals for this site will be subject to the commercial future land use designation, the general commercial zoning district development standards, and the deed restrictions and reverted clause for the site um, filed at Aura Book and page 29564, page 705, and Aura Book 30338, page 400, and will follow the village's review process and ensure compliance. This application was considered on April 23, 2019 by the local planning agency, and they voted to approve by a vote of 5 to 0. Staff is re request... Uh, recommending approval of this application, and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bradford. Uh, <clears throat> would the applicant like to make any comments? Okay, you, you're satisfied with the presentation made by staff. Okay. I do not have any comment, public comment cards on agenda item R1, but if anyone would like to comment on this agenda item, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R1, and I think Selena, your light's on. I just have a quick question, but I think Bradford, you sure. can handle it. So I, the thought was to turn this into a parking lot for the church, correct? That was yeah. the plan with that. So now that we have our new or our rules in place as far as since they're tearing down half the trees, will they need to be replaced or is there landscaping involved in with the parking lot? Uh, I, I don't believe that there is any trees involved with this parcel, but if they were removing those trees to accommodate this development, then they would be um, replacing those trees or they would have to adhere to our replacement schedule. That's correct. Thank you. With, along that line, replacement in other parts of the village or within that proximity? That would be up to the applicant, how they determine okay. you know, the use of those trees. All right, good. Any other comments, questions from members on council? I do need to read the ordinance title. title. Thank okay. you. This is ordinance number 887, an ordinance of the village council of the village of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, adopting an amendment to its comprehensive development development plan in accordance with the mandate set forth in section 163.3187 at SEC Florida statutes pursuant to a privately initiated application number 17-0071 SCPA which provides for an amendment to the village future land use map designating 5.55 plus or minus acres more or less of real property is calm commercial which property is located at 10701 Okeechobee Boulevard informally known as lot one of the capstone at Royal Palm Beach Platte Further providing for transmittal of the State Land Planning Agency, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further comments from members on council, I'll look for a motion. Move to approve uh, regular agenda item number one. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R1 was approved 5-0. Agenda item R2 is also a public hearing to consider application number 18-115. An applicant by an application by Cutler and Herring Inc. and adoption of resolution 19-21, confirming council action. 
The applicant is seeking site plan and architectural approval to amend the approved landscape plan for Pioneer Estates townhomes in order to remove and change certain plant material. Located on the southeast corner of State Road 7 and Pioneer Road, this is a quasi-judicial item and we'll like to have them sworn in. Thank you. So at this time for Pioneer Estates, I'll swear in anyone from the applicant's team and from village staff. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And I'll ask counsel if they have any ex parte disclosures that they need to make. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Great. The applicant is seeking site plan and architectural approval to amend the approved landscaping for Pioneer Estates townhouses. The applicant is requesting to remove material in certain areas, add landscaping in certain areas, and swap species in certain areas. Bill Chef has reviewed, reviewed the proposed site plan and architectural approval to change the previously approved landscape plan and have determined that the proposal meets the requirements of village code and does not diminish, diminish the original quality of this project. Um, the re relevant criteria that staff used for this application is provided here on this slide. The applicant contends that the reason for these changes is due to ensuring long-term stability, swapping of plant material due to wet and poorly drained soils, overcrowded and overshadowing conditions, um, utilize larger growing shrubs, and replace the weak-rooted tab yellow tababuya trees. The applicant has provided a justification statement that um, outlines these changes. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered this application on May 14th and recommended approval by a vote of 5-0. to zero and staff is recommending approval of this application. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bradford. Uh, would the applicant like to make any comments? No. Satisfied with the presentation made? Okay. I do not have any public comment cards on agenda item R2, but if anyone would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R2. Open up for comments from members on council. If there are no comments, I'll look for a motion. <clears throat> motion to approve regular agenda item R2. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R2 was approved 5-0. Agenda item R3 is a public hearing to consider application 18-106, an application by Schmidt Nichols, an adoption of resolution 19-20, confirming council action. The applicant is seeking site plan modifications and architectural approval for an existing vehicle sales and or rental use situated on approximately 33.43 acre parcel of land located at 9205 Southern Boulevard. Uh, this is also a quasi-judicial item, so we have to have them sworn in. Thank you, and staff is still sworn in, but if anyone from Toyota's team would like to raise their right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, and I'll ask counsel if anyone has any ex parte disclosures that they need to make. No. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the applicant is proposing various modifications to the site, which include 41,797 square feet um, of new construction, of which 26,509 square feet had previously been contemplated as phase two of the previously approved Toyota site plan. The applicant is requesting a net increase of 15,288 square feet to the existing Toyota sales site. The ap applicant has proposed to block off drive aisles on the Toyota parcel, which will prevent patrons and the general public from accessing the rear of house and vehicle inventory storage spaces. And to accommodate new additions to the existing building, fire department access will be maintained to the back of the house and the rear of the buildings through the provisions of rolling gates and knox boxes. Reconfiguration of the landscape will also occur as part of this expansion. And as you can see here, the inspection, expansion of this building will um, expand into the existing drive aisles. So they're taking some of that foundation planning from the original building, putting it on the um, new additions. And those are all outlined here on this slide. The proposed site meets the requirements for the industrial limited zoning district in regards to parcel size, parcel width, setbacks, pervious area, parking requirements, landscape areas, and maximum building height. The applicant is seeking architectural approval to the existing Toyota building. Much of the architectural changes are a result of the addition. Much of the colors and materials remain the same. The applicant has provided elevation drawings and they're shown here on this slide. The applicant is also seeking architectural approval to change the signage on the south elevation, as shown here on this slide. 
In reviewing the proposed site plan modification, village staff considered compatibility with adjacent land uses consistency with the village's comprehensive plan in conformance with the industrial limit development standards of section 2692. Planning and Zoning Commission um, approved this application by a vote of five to zero, and staff is recommending approval of this application. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Bradford. Um, <clears throat> does the applicant choose to make any comments? Actually, I do have a question. Um, it used to be called Royal Palm Toyota. Why the change? Um, Nobody wants to answer that question? <laughs> so the, the previous owners... If you could the, just state your name for the record, please. Uh, Andrew Scarce. The previous owners that had it, they had a lot of upper management change uh, before. Within two years, they had eight general managers, and the way they treated the the public put a really bad name on the dealership, and so that's why we changed the name. Really? Hmm. Is that really what happened? Really? That's really interesting. So you changed the name to change the persona of the dealership, but at the same time, you killed the Royal Palm name. Okay. Business is business. How are things going now? Good. That's why we're expanding. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. It was a, just a question. I had. Interesting. Maybe, maybe they'll find, they can find their way back at some point saying that they <coughs> will do, business will be better if they put the name back. I, but okay, at least, at least you answered the question. Um, I don't have any public cards on agenda item R3, but if anyone here would like to comment at this time, that would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing agenda item R3 to public comment, opening up for any additional comments from members on council. If done, there are none, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item number three. Second. We have a motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R3 was approved 5-0. Good luck. Agenda item R4 is a public hearing to consider application number 18-07, an application by Urban Design Kilday Studios, an adoption of landscape waiver LW-19-01, confirming the council action. The applicant, is seek, the applicant is requesting a waiver from the landscape requirements of section 15-131B, sub 1, to allow the acquired 25-foot landscape buffer to taper from 25 feet down to zero feet for an area of approximately 233 linear feet. Located on the south side of Southern Boulevard and west of State Road 7, this is a quasi-judicial item, so we'll have to have people sworn in. Thank you, and uh, number four and number five are related, so I will swear in everyone for four and five and ask for ex parte on both in just a moment. So if you are the applicant's team for number four or number five on the uh, regular agenda and the village is already still sworn in, applicant's team, if you could raise your right hand for me. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. And it looks like I got pod three sworn in there too, so we don't have to do that again. <laughs> Even though this is just Lowe's Road. Um, and now I'll turn to uh, council for Lowe's Road applications, <coughs> four and five, and ask if there's any ex parte disclosures that you need to make. None. No. 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 Right. Thank you. <clears throat> the applicant is seeking a landscape waiver pursuant to section 15131B1 to allow for a reduction in the width of the required 25 foot buffer. <coughs> Uh, landscape buffer, Erica Boulevard along with Tuttle Bo Boulevard will allow for through traffic from Southern Boulevard to State Road 7. This is the proposed new road that is located generally at the intersection of Southern Boulevard and State Road 7 as you can see here on this slide. Um, the applicant is intending to taper in a certain area the perimeter buffer width along the south side of the proposed Erica Boulevard from 25 feet down to zero for approximately 233 linear feet and it's um, illustrated here on this slide this is where the taper will occur down to zero the reason for the landscape waiver request is due to erica boulevard being constrained in a certain area due to an existing lake work drainage district canal easement on the south side of the road the landscaping for these roadways meet all other village code requirements um, this is a aerial photograph that shows the area in which the, um, the buffer will be reduced. The Planning and Zoning Commission approved this application um, and staff is recommending approval of this application. And if you remember, we um, as staff 
Um, we all wanted to be fully, fully open and honest whenever the comprehensive plan amendment came through. Um, and we mentioned this landscape waiver. We wanted you guys to know if you were approving that um, landscape or the, I'm sorry, that comp plan amendment, that this, this particular landscape waiver will be coming forward um, to you. And that's, what, that, that's where we're at tonight. Um, and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bradford. Does the applicant like to make any comments? You satisfied with the presentation provided by staff? It's up to you if you want to share them. It's your call. Okay. For the record, Alessandria Palmer with Urban Design Kill Day Studios tonight representing the applicant TLH properties. Okay, so as Bradford had gone over the location of the land area that is requiring the landscape waiver is just south of pod three within what we're calling the Lowe's Road site plan area. It's just west of uh, Lowe's and, and Publix. Here's just a close up of that aerial. And this is actually a shot from the property appraisers. It gives you a little bit more detail on what we own in purple and what we don't. So that is essentially the issue here is that there's a parcel of land as um, Bradford mentioned that is controlled by Lake Worth Drainage District. And in that area, we are unable to provide the required 25 foot landscape. So to get to that point, there's gonna have to be a taper where the land gets shorter and then eventually through that portion of the road next in the Lake Worth drainage easement, we are um, not going to be able to provide landscape until we get onto the other side of the canal. And this just provides a little bit more information on that same aerial you just saw um, with some graphic showing the landscape as it tapers down and then of course the red area is the location where there will not be any landscape adjacent to the roadway i believe that's all i have on that okay <clears throat> um let me just go back because i actually have we met with victoria <coughs> groves last week as you know we've been meeting with them for the last two years but um we once they received the notices for the public hearings they had reached out to me this slide technical difficulties i don't know you can't see it you're just trying to get to this slide right yeah here. and i had hit it but i Anyhow, sorry. Um, so we had, we met with them on May 8th. There was um, some concern regarding the landscape waiver because this time they actually received the notice for the landscape waiver unlike in the previous comp plan amendment. So um, they had received, I guess, a call from one of the residents that's adjacent to that area. And there was some concern regarding the fact that they wouldn't have the buffer directly north of them. So we have um, proposed to design a landscape plan to increase the landscape in their buffer within Victoria Groves. Um, we, this all occurred within the last week, so we haven't gotten to the design yet. We haven't looked at their approved buffer plans or anything like that, but we told them that we are going to coordinate that with them. We would um, send somebody to go do some observation of what's there, the grading and whatnot. When, once we have all that information, we'll send them a proposal for their review and coordinate with Bradford's office to make sure that it's consistent with the approved buffer plan. And they were satisfied with it. Good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I do not have any comment cards on agenda item R4, but if anyone here uh, would like to comment at this time, please come forward. Uh, 
the uh, you gotta introduce yourself name crystal clark address 235 river bluff lane royal palm beach i just wanted to ask if what you just commented about working with victoria grove is there a way that whatever that work is done you guys make sure that that's done that the victoria grove people are satisfied with it are you from victoria Grove? no oh okay <laughs> okay and the second part is, is as you were uh, vigorous about making sure that citizens uh, correctly abide by landscaping and tree cutting things, I would hope that we would be just as vigorous with developers and anyone else who wants to do business with the city. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No further public comment on agenda item R4, and I'm gonna close public comment on agenda R4 and go to council, starting with Selena. Actually, and that was my question, is I wanted to confirm the information from Victoria Groves to make sure that there was a buffer allotted for that area too, or, so thank you. Okay. If there are no further comments then from members on council, um, Jan, did you wanna comment? No. Oh. Then I look for, I look for a motion. I make a motion to approve regular agenda item number four. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R4 was approved 5-0. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Agenda item R5 is a public hearing to consider application 18-113, an application by Urban Design Kilday Studios, an adoption of resolution 19-15, confirming a council action. The applicant is seeking site plan and landscape plan architectural approval for a roadway comprising 10 tracts of land totaling approximately 11.20 acres located on the south side of Southern Boulevard and west of State Road 7. This is a quasi <coughs> issue. Were they sworn in for this already? We did and I already asked for ex parte so we're, we're good okay, to go. So we're good. Thank you. Okay, graphic. Great, thank you. Um, as you stated, the applicant is seeking site plan approval and landscape plan architectural approval for a roadway comprising 10 tracts of land, totaling approximately 11.2 acres. <clears throat> These tracts consist of several single family homes on large tracts. The applicant has indicated <clears throat> in their justification statement that the goal is to develop the property for roadway purposes. Additionally, Erica Boulevard along with Tuttle Boulevard will also allow for through traffic from Southern to State Road 7. Furthermore, Lofts Road will provide access to Pot 8, which is intended to be an approximately 10-acre park that will satisfy the park, the part of the off-site public recreation requirements for Pot 2, 3, and 4. And in reviewing the proposed site plan, approval and landscape plan, or architectural approval of the parcels to the village's general commercial zoning district, village staff considering compatibility with adjacent land uses and consistency with the village's comprehensive plan in conformance with the general commercial Zoning standards in section 2689, and those are parcel size, parcel width, setbacks, <clears throat> previous area, landscape plan. The Planning and Zoning Commission considered this application on May 14th at their meeting and recommended approval by a vote of 5-0, and st staff is recommending approval of this application. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bradford. <clears throat> Does the applicant choose to make any comments? No? So we're satisfied with the presentation made by staff. Okay. <clears throat> I do not have any public comment cards on agenda item R5, but if anyone would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R5 and opening up for comment from members on council. I see no lights, so I'll look for a motion. Move to approve uh, regular agenda item number five. Second. We have a, a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R5 was approved 5-0. <clears throat> agenda item R6 is a public hearing to consider variance application 18-93, an application by Urban Design Kilday Studios, an approval of variance order VC19-02 to allow the use of tandem parking spaces for a multifamily residential development to court to count toward the required parking where village code section 23-49B sub one 
allows tandem parking to be counted only for single family residents. To allow six parking spaces to be used exclusively by the U.S. Postal, Postal Service during certain times when Village Code Section 23-51 sub 1 sub D requires that such spaces be available for <coughs> residents and guests at all times. And to reduce the number of required parking spaces for the site from 735 to 717 for a variance of 18 parking spaces required by Village Code Section 25-51 sub 1 sub D. For a property located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately seven tenths of a mile west of State Road 7. This is quasi judicial. Thank you. And I did swear everyone in already, but I will ask for number six, seven, I'm sorry, just number six and eight. Those both involve the same application if council has any ex parte disclosures that they need to make. No. no. Thank you. Great. I won't cover um, all the information that the mayor has pr um, already provided. So I'm going to just jump right into uh, Village Code Section 2353A1 allows the Village Council to grant variances to the parking code when special conditions and circumstances exist which are not applicable to other lands. Special con conditions do not result from the actions of the applicant, will not confer on the applicant special privileges that are denied to other lands, literal interpretation of the code would deprive the applicant the rights enjoyed by other lands minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of the property. The variance will be in harmony with the general intent and purpose of the zoning code. The applicant contends that although the code does not allow the use of tandem spaces, there is no way to prevent the use of them by the future residents when garage apartments are developed. Um, requiring additional parking spaces with no consi uh, consideration given to the tandem parking spaces will resort, result in excess parking of the proposed project. The applicant feels the code was developed at a time when garages were not widely constructed with apartments. The proposed variance will reduce environmental impacts and provide more flexible design options and open space. The applicant has pr um, proposed that in the event that the parking does become an issue, they have committed to adding the parking spaces in the area highlighted here. They would rather dedicate this area to recreation space and open space to their residents. Village staff does not support this variance because staff believes that no special circumstance exists which are not applicable to other lands. The condition is the result of the actions of the applicant and will confer on the applicant special privileges that are denied to other lands. Little interpretation of the code does not deprive the applicant of the rights enjoyed by other lands in the same zoning district. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered this application on May 14th and recommended approval by a vote of four to zero. Again, staff is recommending denial of this application. However, there has been similar variances approved under cir similar circumstances in which a variance tandem parking spaces has occurred. And the most recent was at the phase one north or the um, related group, the one that is being constructed now and at the Enclave, <clears throat> and the village hasn't received any complaints regarding the use of tandem parking spaces at the Enclave. And furthermore, to that point, um, they had a review period um, of a year in which um, if it became a problem, then they would have to construct, much like this applicant is committing to, those additional parking spaces. That never occurred. I mean, that that those conflicts never occurred in order for them to have to go in and then um, construct those additional parking spaces because well, the in other words, spaces it worked out. You're saying just didn't become a problem, right? All right. Um, and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brad. And Mayor, if I can add one thing, just to clarify the record, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, when they looked at this, they approved it by a vote of four to one. Did I say four to one? Four, four to zero. zero. Oh, geez. You <laughs> yeah. said four to zero. With one dissent. Um, and, and also, just so you know, in the proposed variance order, if council were to approve this tonight, we did add in the condition that was similar to related site that there will be this alternative parking plan. And we look at the parking situation on site when they're 93% occupancy. That's when we'll make the call as to whether or not they have to um, develop the alternative spaces, which is similar to what we did for Enclave and for the related site. So we're being consistent. Right. Correct. Right. Has the applicant agreed to that condition? Yes. Yes? Okay. You let the record show that the applicant nodded their head yes and said yes. Okay. <laughs> affirmative. Yes. Okay. Uh, I do not have any comment cards on agenda item R6, but if anyone would like to comment, now would be the time. Come on down. 
Once again, Crystal Clark, 235 River Bluff Lane, which is in the Seminole Lakes uh, complex, which is very parking limited, which is very much a headache, which we have relay races for parking spaces and who can get home from work first and who can get their grandkids to come over first and get a space in the little space in front of their house first. It's very parking limited. I don't know how they got away with that. I would really ask you to really look into these things because it really is an issue for residents in certain places with this parking stuff. So noted. Um, Go ahead. Can I, uh, do, do you have or do you know how many uh, apartments or, or townhouses over there, do they have the uh, parking garages and then spaces outside the parking we garage? We have a garage and a driveway at your townhouse. Okay. There is designated visitors, I thought visitors parking, but because the driveways are so narrow, residents park in those parking spaces because the streets are all so narrow and the fire trucks can't get through the streets in the night so residents get tickets or stickers on their cars at night and because you can't park, you got to try to caddy corner park so that somebody can get through the streets to get, it's really awful. I was very upset with my husband for purchasing that, <laughs> but I am not the boss of things. But anyway, the we issue is that. parking is very much okay. a problem. And even when residents want to, this owners want to like expand their driveways, then we get into the landscaping and the tree issue. So parking is really a problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank I just want to share something with you though. In the beginning of the meeting, when I say if anyone wants to speak about items not on the agenda, that's that's the kind of thing that you could speak about, not on the agenda. Because your comments aren't specifically germane to this application, but I get it. It's the, the it's this issue that you want to share. Thank you. We just want the issue okay. in the air. Don't know if we can do anything about it, but thanks for sharing. <laughs> the issue in the air. Okay. okay. Any further comments from members of the public? on agenda item R6. If not, I'm gonna close public comment on agenda item R6. I think Selena was lit up first. I just had a quick question. So for clarification, tandem parking is, there is garage parking, there's a driveway, and it's parking on the driveway. That's correct. So it's still attached to their unit. That's correct. It's not as though they're taking up extra spaces on the outside or on the yes. side streets or Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then for Simplifying the staff's perspective on take out all the okay yeah thanks we we have to evaluate these on the those those specific criteria that I mentioned in my presentation uh, we don't have we don't have the latitude to take into account um, current conditions or current market trends of the garage with the driveway. Maybe it's something that we should look into as far as our code is concerned, but this is the mechanism to allow for tandem parking spaces in this type of scenario at this time. Okay. And I, I pulled up um, a slide from the agent's um, presentation. And if you look at this slide, so one of the things that um, was brought up at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting was is that when somebody's parked in the garage, then this person that's parked in the driveway then has to jockey. But if you look at this slide, you will see that there is a lot of parking opportunity if that individual was in their driveway and needed to then park in one of the parking spaces and then get into their garage and pull their car out. Um, unlike um, this young lady's um, scenario, we have 20% um, visitor parking that is provided on this site. Yeah, I um, shared Ms. Clark's concerns as well, but because we've got a situation where, you know, like the other apartment buildings that are there, the, if this is a problem, with, they've already they made a commitment to remedy it, and it didn't, not that it won't be a problem, but it wasn't a problem with the related, so I'm comfortable with the assurance that if, if it becomes a problem, the spaces will get there, so mm -hmm. I'd make a motion to approve um, agenda item R6. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the, let the record show that agenda item R6 was approved 5-0.
Agenda item R7 is a public hearing pursuant to section 163 dot, uh, dash, uh, not dash, dot, 3225 sub 1 Florida statutes to consider application number 19-30, requ requesting approval of a development agreement between a village and a developer for a proposed 318-unit multifamily residential development on approximately 23.952 acres located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately <clears throat> seven-tenths of a mile west of State Road 7. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> the applicant is requesting approval of a development agreement between the Village of Royal Palm Beach and the developer of the Southern Boulevard Properties Pod 3 in accordance with sections 163.3220-163.3243, Florida Statutes, the Florida Local Governing Development Agreement Act. The developer is proposing minimum unit floor areas which are less than those required by Village Code in the RM14 Zoning District at sections 2686. 4H. This subsection, subsection allows for a reduction in the minimum floor area requirements if the project de developer enters into such agreement in accordance with the Act. This slide illustrates the differences between what the applicant is proposing and what our village code requires. Um, the village code also specifies a minimum average unit size of um, 1,200 square feet for each building within the development. The applicant is proposing a minimum average building size for the buildings listed here on this slide. The applicant, I'll leave that slide up. The applicant contends that the proposed development consists of 318 multifamily homes within 13 separate buildings and plentiful community features such as a pool, clubhouse, fitness center, vegetable garden, outdoor dining areas, play field, picnic area, tot lot, dog park, and volleyball courts, as well as numerous walking trails for future residents to enjoy. In order to achieve the desired amount of amenities and spacing for the proposed development, a reduction to the size of, the, of several of the multifamily units is being requested at this time. The reduction in the size of the units is needed to address demand within the current housing market as families and individuals seek to maximize their relationship with their local communities and outdoor experiences. Rather, desire to live in housing with excessive levels of space and impervious land area. The Local Planning and Zoning Commission considered this application on, at their May 14th meeting and recommended approval by vote of four to one. <laughs> Staff is recommending denial of this application um, and its associated development agreement. However, there has been sil similar development agreements approved under sim similar circumstances and most recent was at Phase 1 North and the Enclave. Um, the units in pod three overall exceed the apartment sizes of the phase one, the related site, and also the enclave. So although they are going for their developer's agreement, the, these overall, these units are larger, larger than, those than those that have been that we've already yes, sir. proven in the past. Right. Okay. And I'll turn the floor over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bradford. Uh, does the applicant choose to make any comments? No? no. You're satisfied with the presentation of the staff? Okay. Uh, I do not have any public comment cards for agenda item R7, but if anyone from the public would like to comment on agenda item R7, now would be the time. <clears throat> Seeing none, I'm closing public comment to agenda item R7 and opening it up for comments from members on council. There's no lights. If there are no comments, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve agenda item R7. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. We have one opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda R, um, item R7 was approved by a vote of four to one. Thank you. You still don't want to comment? <laughs> okay. Agenda item R8 is a public hearing to consider application 18-92, an application <clears throat> by Urban Design Kilday Studios and resolution no number 19-16, confirming council action. The applicant is seeking site plan and architectural approval for a 318-unit multifamily residential development located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately seven-tenths of a mile west of State Road 7. This is quasi-judicial. <clears throat> and we are good to proceed. Great. Thank you. Um, the applicant is seeking <clears throat> site plan and architectural approval for a proposed multifamily residential development on a 239 Five two acre parcel of land. The site is situated within the multifamily RM14 zoning district. 
The site currently has several single family homes on large tracks. The applicant has indicated in their justification statement that the, old, that the goal is developed for um, 318 multifamily dwelling units with a gross density of 13.28 um, units per acre. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, 318 units will divide between 13 buildings. <clears throat> the proposed site plan has seven building types, which unit counts range from four units to 36 units per building. The apartments in the development range from one bedroom and one bathroom to three bedrooms and two and a half bathrooms. The site will also contain a 1.94 acre lake for on-site retention. In addition, the site provides 12.21 acres of green and open space. Access to the site will be from Southern Boulevard via a new bridge over the C-51 canal and future access to State Road 7 south of Lowe's. <clears throat> Pursuant to 2675G2 of Village Code requirements for recreation space are 10 acres of recreation space per every 1,000 residents. Each dwelling unit generates 2.5 residents per Village Code, thus based upon the proposed 318 multifamily dwelling units, 7.95 acres of recreation space is required. Section 2675H2 allows for a credit of private open space where up to 50% of the required recreation can be provided as private open space to the residents of the subdivision. The applicant is, <clears throat> is proposing to provide a total of 2.7 acres of private recreation on site for a total of 34% of the project recreation obligation. The private recreation areas proposed will include pool, clubhouse, fitness center, vegetable garden, outdoor dining areas, play field, picnic area, tot lot, dog park, volleyball court, as well as numerous walking trails. The applicant is also offering to pay a fee in lieu of dedication and land of the village for 1.28 acres or 16% of the project's recreation obligation. The village code section 2675.4 H3 allows for a fee in lieu of dedication of land and the applicant is proposing a $320,000 per acre fee in lieu of payment for 1.28 acres of recreation obligation for a total of $409,600. The applicant will also be dedicating 3.98 acres of land totaling 50% of their remaining recreation obligation. The 3.9 acres will be part of the pod eight, which was intended to be receiving area for recreation obligations for pod two, three, and four, and total approximately 10 acres. In reviewing this petition, we considered um, parcel size, conformance with the village code, um, as it relates to parcel size, parcel width, setbacks, pervious area, landscape areas, parking requirements, maximum building height. The applicant is also requesting architectural approval for the apartment buildings. And the applicant has indicated that the project signage would be part of future architectural approval request. The applicant has submitted um, landscape plan and, and color renderings, as you see here on this slide. Um, this is an illustration of the clubhouse. Um, and as I stated at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, I've seen a lot of clubhouses. This is one is a big clubhouse. <laughs> um, <Delivered>. Right. Um, <laughs> Overall, the proposed site plan is conformance with the village's requirements for multifamily residential zoning district. The Planning Zoning Commission considered this application on May 14, 2019 and voted um, to recommend approval by a vote of 5-0. And staff is recommending approval of this application. And I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Oh, yep. Let me. <clears throat> we are recommending a condition of approval, ah. which, which will outline how these um, the construction and how the different phases of this development will progress in the future uh, um, I would like to read that into the record here tonight okay no engineering permit application shall be accepted prior to the preliminary master plat approval by village council no building permit application shall be accepted prior to the Lowe's Road site plan approval master plan approval and final master plat approval additionally no certificate of occupancy shall be issued until the park is deeded and accepted by the village of royal palm beach unless a different time frame for the deeded for the deed and acceptance is agreed to by the village and in, in the construction agreement for the requirements required improvements and no certificate of occupancy shall be issued until all infrastructure supporting the development is complete and accepted in accordance with chapter 22 of village code including but not limited to the completion of all of lowe's road from state road 7 to total boulevard and Luffs Road, Luffs Road to the proposed public park. And that, that concludes my presentation, Mayor. I'll turn the floor to you, thank you. All right, thanks, Bradford. 
Does the applicant agree to the conditions of approval? Yes, I do. Okay. Would the applicant like to make any further comments? Be satisfied with the presentation provided by staff. Okay. I do not have any public comment cards for agenda item R8, but if anyone would like to comment from the public, now would be the time. <clears throat> Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R8 and open up for comments from member on members on council. If there are no comments, I'll look for a motion. I'll move to approve uh, regular agenda item R8. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R8 was approved 5-0. Agenda item R9 is a public hearing for a second reading and adoption of uh, ordinance number 990, amending chapter 23, traffic and vehicles, at section 23-51. Required minimum number of parking spaces. <clears throat> In order to add minimum parking space requirements for private recreational facilities and single family and multifamily residential communities. Yes, and this is second reading. We had full discussion at the last meeting. If you remember, this is just to add an actual parking requirement to the community res the community recreation pods, which right. we, we do not have currently. I'll be happy to read the ordinance title when you're ready, Mayor. Okay. Uh, I do not have any comment cards from anyone from the public on agenda item R9, but if anyone would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item, uh, item R9, and any comments from members on council? If there are none, you can read my title. Thank you. This is ordinance number 990, an ordinance of the Village Council of the Village of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 23, Traffic and Vehicles of the Code of Ordinances of the Village of Royal Palm Beach at Article 2, Parking at Division 4, Off-Street Parking and Loading Facilities Requirements. At Section 23-51, Required Minimum Number of Parking Spaces. In order to add minimum parking space requirements for private recreational facilities in single-family and multi-family residential communities, further providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 23, chapter, Traffic and Vehicles, shall remain in full force and effect, as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. Thank you. Okay, if there are no comments from members on council, look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item number nine. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R9 was approved 5-0. Okay, agenda item R10 is our annual review and evaluation and merit pay determination for the village manager. We're so late already. <laughs> no, no. So I'm sure all of you have had yeah. your individual reviews with the village manager. What we'd like to do this evening is maybe have you just give us our summary on, on your evaluation um, and uh, I'll comment on, on the compensation uh, discussion after that. We'll start with you, Jen. You started with me last year. Okay, then we'll start with you, <laughs> Selena. <laughs> I'm happy to start. I'm happy to start. I think our village manager does an excellent job. When we look at the um, criteria for which we are to evaluate him over employee relations, image, long-range planning, financial management, communication with the village council, and capital projects, completion and direction, I think he's um, achieving um, high efficiency and best practices in all these areas. Um, specifically, when I look, my observation of employee relations is really the longevity and the, as we're celebrating 20 years again for another employee, and, and, and that to me speaks volumes of how he works with his employees. Um, the image of the village and Ray is very protective of um, how we, what we say, how we appear, and that makes me very comfortable. Um, Long-range planning, we've got the strategic planning that we do every year. This is evidence of this long-range planning and, and um, all the work that he and his team does every year. Um, financial management, very, um, you know, no increases in taxes in the past a million years, right? And um, prudent budgeting and responsible spending. This is just, I mean, I can go on. I'm a communications with me is very, um, it's easy, it's very responsive. Um, and then our, our capital improvement and, and completion and direction of that is, um, again, I, 
I have no um, I have no areas to say that there's anything to point out in a weakness so okay Jeff you're on well, I'll keep mine brief just to say that uh, what, what Jan said I, I would agree with and uh, but but I will will add to it that um, um, not only do do I appreciate uh, the quality of the work that uh, our village manager does, but it's also appreciated uh, in in uh, in the county uh, among peers of his and also uh, other elected officials that I have the opportunity to talk to. Uh, we're fortunate to to have him here. One of the things uh, that I think is kind of an interesting uh, observation, and it is that. Uh, with an engineering background, you, know, you would expect a, a very structured, rigorous, um, maybe in the box kind of a thinker. And quite frankly, I, I see a, a, a individual in, in Ray who um, uh, definitely can get out of the box as a visionary. Um, he actually brought us the strategic planning uh, activity. And, and uh, that, of course, encourages all of us to look down the road and, and and try to create in our minds what we think uh, the village ought to be going forward. Uh, we owe that to Ray's leadership. He brought it to us, uh, and it gets better and better every year. And it also gives us to talk about financial management, a great basis for us to build our, our budget with the details on the action plan and that type of thing. Uh, and of course, the long-term employees. I mean, people come here and make a career. Uh, there's a reason they stay. and and. In large measure, it's it's due uh, to his leadership, and so uh, I think he does an outstanding job. And and one of one of my favorite things about Ray is that um, he's always looking for ways to improve, and I uh, can't ask for much more than that. So, good. Thank you. I uh, think Ray's doing an excellent job as well. I rated him a five on everything. Except for on employee relations, he got a four because the Gators beat the Seminoles and embarrassed him in Tallahassee. <laughs> and he got a four on completion Getting direction good. of capital projects because I'm still waiting for that damn chandelier, chandelier <laughs> over at the cultural <laughs> center, which is going to be there forever. Be but <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's it. Could have gone to Capitol Life. Great job, though. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Selena. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Rudusky, for going first because it makes it easier to say thank. I, I do agree with the, a lot of what um, she had said. I also do look at longevity of staff, though, too, and we talk about that. And, and it is a testament um, to leadership, but also to the work environment. I think even though everyone may not always agree with you, I find you very fair. And that goes for the entire staff. I mean, the, the staff and you make it easier for me. I can't speak for anybody else, but being prepared and making sure I understand and taking the time and everything with it. Um, one of my complaints that I've always had about Ray is to see the softer side of Ray. And I got to see that this year when Kathy retired. So it was ah. nice to see that, that side oh, of you. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Yes. So um, I do, and I appreciate you taking the time with me. And I know you help some of the other council members on their personal projects and everything. So you go above and beyond with that. So thank you. Good. Uh, I think Ray is, is just an outstanding manager for the village. Um, the, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I talked earlier this year when we had a strategic planning about as a team, and I used a football metaphor about going to the Super Bowl and all of that good stuff. But the reality is, is um, it, we've worked as a, a collectively as a leadership team with Ray as our manager uh, to get us where we are in terms of the village, its prosperity and, and its good standing, and um, from what I get feedback from many, many happy citizens in the village. Uh, that speaks volumes of the leadership that Ray and his leadership team uh, do every day uh, to keep this village moving on the right track. Um, I always evaluate senior management. Uh, Ray's, uh, I think in, the, in our ordinance or charter, his title is COO, Chief Operations Officer. And, and when I evaluate executive positions, I look at the outcomes that they create. Not necessarily what they're doing, uh, necessarily how they're going about getting it done, uh, but it's at the end of the day, when you're at that level of, 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 of leadership, you, it's the outcomes you create, the results you generate, and how well you're able to execute a plan that the leadership team as a whole has agreed on. And he does that in an excellent way. 
Um, it's been a pleasure working with Ray uh, over the years. Uh, I've seen him grow exponentially in his, his leadership ability. And I love when he and I have a problem, we have problems to try to kick around. And, and there was a lot of creative thinking that goes on and some interesting ideas come up. So it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure working with him. Um, with that, um, the next item we have on the agenda is, unless you want to comment, right? Ed, you want, not yet? Okay. You want to hear that point? <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the careful, right? <laughs> <laughs> Regular agenda item number eleven is the consideration of a proposed uh, fifth-year employment agreement for the village manager to be effective on May sixteenth, two thousand nineteen, and to end on May fifteenth, two thousand twenty-four, subject to renewal options upon agreement of both parties. I guess. What I want to do is put in context, uh, unless maybe I should let Jennifer comment on it first, give us the legal reality of this. Sure, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to okay. you because I know you you wanted to talk about yeah. the compensation and in, in, in relation to the the possible merit increase this time around. Okay, so uh, Ray's contract does expire in June of this year. Um, traditionally, council has uh, used a, a three-year term to the contract. Uh, Ray asked this year, instead of a uh, salary increase, he asked just to have a five-year term instead of a three-year term. Um, as I explained to you all individually on the phone uh, before the meeting, that does absolutely nothing to change council's ability to uh, terminate your manager at, at will anytime that you feel that you need to. It's just the how often do we have to renegotiate the contract from scratch. So um, Ray thought that that fit more into his future planning um, to have a five-year term than a three-year term. So that's what he's proposing uh, tonight. Um, the base salary is going to stay the same as his current pay, uh, which um, he'll still continue to get the uh, cost of living increases if those are offered to the other employees at his same um, exempt level in the village. And then um, if you all approve a merit uh, pay tonight, that would be inserted into the contract. And so those are really the only changes okay. from the last contract, Mayor. So I, I guess what we're, what we're looking at here is um, with an with a implementation of a five-year agreement, we won't have a negotiation process over the next five years. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to recommend tonight that we give Ray an actual 5% increase to his base pay. And then going forward, he'd be, we'd be back at the you get that 5% or whatever percentage it is, but it's more like a bonus. It doesn't become part of the base pay. But just for this first year for tonight, I would like us to, to consider uh, making that 5% increase part of his base pay. Who was first? Go ahead. No, I was, I was just gonna say that I, I agree with that. I remember I still think from, from the beginning when he made the transition from Village. You remember that time? Yeah, I do remember yeah. it. I think you and I were the only ones we were still here. around yeah. from that. But yeah. uh, when he was village um, engineer yeah. slash assistant uh, village manager, I mean, I, I think he was kind of lowballed a little bit. So I think this will hopefully rectify that scale. What is it? Nine years later. Um, but I, uh, I'm in support of it. I, I agree with the mayor's proposition. Selena, I think my only clarification was is that. Um, because everyone is in a silo of pay so your position you're a high and a low and i believe you, we're at an average right now or you're below is it now you're below that is that correct for that the average correct. and that so i would when you look at it, that is is to get into that average of where it is comparable to all versus saying here let's just give this percentage and go and then tack on from there and everything is let's make it comparable to where it should be, and if that's the difference, whatever that difference is. Well, I'm proposing 5%. I don't know how much that moves the dial in that regard, but that was the number I was proposing. Okay. Because all staff is buying it online. That's the only other. Yeah. Um, Jeff? So the, what we're talking about, just so I'm clear on it, is a 5% increase in current salary as the base salary for the new contract. Right. Is that correct. What, That's correct. What's being suggested? That's correct. And then, of course, in each year, we're looking at uh, the merit pay potential. We have the option each year of going, doing what we've been doing over the last right. several years of it just being like but a bonus. But not adding to the base. But not right. adding to the base. Okay. Right. Exactly. All right. right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. 
Right. That's so the 192 number reflected in the agreement, correct? Correct. So if that's, you that's if you base. did do a 5% increase to the base salary, raise uh, salary would go from the 192 to 201 and 970, almost 202,000 a year. Okay. And that's my question then is how does that compare to, does that put them in that range because all staff is well, within a range? You in a, in a, what, the 50 percentile? Yeah, the way I we look at the sal the way I look at the salaries for staff here is um, the market. So the first market is the southeast. The southeast is kind of considered the, the drivable market, and then Palm Beach is uh, obviously the closer drivable market. In the southeast, um, in the changes in management over the last couple of years, uh, I I sh went down to minus sixteen percent uh, from the fifty percent mark. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in Palm Beach County. I'm at about three and a half percent under the fifty percent average, and it, I just I and in the state, if you look at the entire state of Florida, which the pays are different throughout the, and you look at the village of Royal Palm Beach as it compares to the people that were in the study. I think there were three hundred thirty-six cities of the four hundred twelve in the study. We were at the seventy-seven percentile, and pay-wise compared to that, I was. Um, one 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 and a half percent under the seventy seven percent. So in the past couple of years, all the new negotiations on contracts have changed, mm -hmm. and I, I, where I was pretty much staying at the fifty percent mark with the cost of living, I have shifted under it anywhere okay. from sixteen percent in the yeah. in the more immediate market mm. to to um, to the um, three and a half percent. People are doing salary surveys. In all the different cities now, uh, Palm Beach uh, just finished an extensive salary survey, and um, they chose to go to comparing all the Palm Beach County employers and going to the 75 percent mark. Um, every, all the different cities are handling it different ways. I think for Royal Palm Beach and, and based on our size and the market that we have out there, um, I've always felt that 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 50 percent mark uh, was a was a good target to be plus or minus of. Dependent on the, the the market of the job. Uh, and and well, I just wanted um, population-wise, we're pretty much in the seventy-something percentile, though. I mean, statewide, though. So we're, yeah, we're talking because seventy-seven percent. Yeah, I'm surprised. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, we think of ourselves as small, but we do live in South Florida, where there are so many, you know, larger, more municipal. Yeah municipalities to where up in North Florida and Central Florida it could be a lot smaller. Thanks. So I guess when I look at it is to get I'm more comfortable getting right back to that 50% than where it is and right now you're, what you're saying is your drop below 16% in the southeast of the southeast comparison. or what it should be right because then you're 77 it's a lot lower than for Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County it was about three and a half percent. Right, so I would feel more comfortable getting Ray back to that fifty percent, whether it's the three and a half percent, and do it from there, because that's a salary, and then keep the merit pay as a separate issue, not to automatically tack that on and do that, and that's the end of it. Because I think we still need to get him back to that if all the staff is so judged the same you're way. You're suggesting more than five percent. No, if it's the three percent to get his salary base up there, and then have a conversation about the merit pay after, because I believe you had suggested taking the five percent merit pay and just adding it on, and that's the base, and we'll do a, we'll have the conversation next year as to well to next go from year. There. Well, yeah, but remember, because we're entering a new five-year contract, we're not going through a negotiation every year. So the pro forma has been that he's at that number base-wise. We won't be increasing the base. We just have the option of giving him the. Like so what I'm saying though is let's get him into that. So let's do the three percent to get him back to that fifty percent, and then do have a question, a conversation about the mayor pay after. Okay, you're, you're recommending three percent instead of five percent. No, I'm recommending three percent right now to get him back as his base salary at that fifty percent compared to where it should be because he's dropped below the fifty percent. Then have a conversation on the merit pay, the percentage, the one through five should be based on that new salary, not. His current and just tacked on. It sounds a little complicated. Can we just go, just give him the five percent? <laughs> well, but now you're saying here's five percent. Just to, there you go because we're below the average and yeah, you're but, not getting paid what you should be getting paid, and it's two different topics. I think Ray would be okay if we went with the five percent increase. What do you? Would you like to comment on that? I would. I <laughs> yes, I would be okay with that. Okay. <laughs> okay, I hear what you're saying, Selena, but I want to try to keep it simple. I don't want to complicate it too much, but. But I understand your point. 
Um, any other further comments? So just yeah. one last thing on the, the merit pay. It still would be a lump sum payment. We're not talking about increases to your salary. But that's going contract. forward. That's not this no, year. That's not this year. The contract is written where the merit pay is, is, is a bonus. Right. That's the way it's currently written. What all we're talking about is tonight and this the, Only the for pay this that year. gets written in starting yeah. okay. five but it's not as he doesn't get that bump plus the merit this right year. he just gets yeah right so the way that okay. the contract will be worded is it will show if if this is approved it would show the increase to the base salary right and then for this initial year the merit pay would actually say zero right that's what i'm understanding so that, that would kick in yeah that, that's right. what oh, i thought okay. it was all right, all right. That's, that's good no no that's why i got it i got it clear yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay yes any other comments? If not, we need to we need to take a vote on this. Yes, and when you do your motion, and do, Mayor, do you want to handle the merit pay separate from the salary increase? Like handle salary increase first, and then, or do you want you there some? Is no merit. There is no merit this year. Well, it needs to be included in the. Okay, so we have to say zero merit this year. Yes, okay. if you can include that in the motion. Who can make that motion? So are we talking about the contract, or are we, are we talking, talking about, about the both evaluation this motion year? To you can do it together. Approval of the contract, your contract, with this year giving him a 5% increase in base and no merit pay this year. Okay, so I'll make that motion as the mayor just stated it, rather than trying to restate it. <laughs> okay. I'll second. Okay. Is the motion clear? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Diane, we have no opposed. Please let the record show that the motion as stated and agreed to by, by the legal counsel <laughs> was approved 5 0. Congratulations, Ray, on another fine year. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, thank you very much. And just a couple. I do have any comments? I do have, I, I, I do have a couple <laughs> comments. And uh, I do feel very fortunate to get to work here. Royal Palm Beach has always been a fair employer, and that's why so many people stay here for the term that they do. Um, We've had a consistent council that has been always fair with the employees and every strategic planning session we go through, there's, there's, there's several issues in there and dealing with employees and, and you guys have been consistent over the years and, and uh, that's appreciated as a manager of the organization. Uh, it's clearly appreciated by the employees too. You know, the, the, the vision thing, I read a great quote the other day by uh, um, Einstein, he said, he said that the secret to vision is hiding your sources. <laughs> and, <laughs> I remember that. And, and, and okay. I got to admit, <laughs> we have a lot of sources here, and, and it really does help. And uh, <laughs> between, you know, the, the way we interact with the council and the way we get your input, um, the input I get from the staff, um, there's a lot of creativity out there, and, yeah. and I know Lou and his department is working really hard on this, on this slogan and getting it out there. And, and we're taking suggestions from everybody. And Lou had a really good one the other day on the on the um, monthly uh, Pulse letter uh, email that, that we put <laughs> out. And it just it, nobody, it just that just didn't grasp us. And and uh, we were meeting the other day, and he suggested Village Voice. And now I know there's other uses of that at, throughout the country, but it, it's not in, around Florida. And I, we like it, and we're gonna we're gonna change the Pulse to the the Village Voice. And uh, and Good start New getting York. that out. Good New York. So, Good. But like I said, it, it is, this is a, an, yeah, this, what we do here is an extreme team effort on, on, on all sides, and it, it's a great team to work with. So I appreciate that, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ray. Okay, we have one last item this evening. I didn't ask, I mentioned, I teased earlier, it was not on the agenda. Um, as you all know, I guess about two years ago, maybe it was three years ago, we, it, it, and one of the themes or discussions in our strategic planning was how we could better reach out to our citizens and, 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 and have more contact. And we've done several things since then to push information out. Um, I'm so proud of the, uh, uh, the, it's coming up Monday night, our uh, citizen summit, where we get a chance to get you know, direct feedback on what we think we should do, what the priorities are. Uh, but one of the things we talked about was trying to create something that uh, captures something in, in a, a fashion like a, a, a five to, to eight minute video that will tell you oh, everything oh, about geez. the village. Now you all have been working with, with, with Elliot. Elliot, come on out here. Yeah. All right, you got to stand oh, up yeah. for this. <laughs> uh, over the last several weeks and uh, it's finally been put together. So tonight we're going to have the first public offering of our new Welcome to uh, the Village of Wall Palm Beach video. 
Uh, we will be sharing this video on uh, Monday night at the Citizen Summit as well. And we will certainly be introducing it to the outside world at uh, uh, the President uh, Hamara's uh, League of Cities meeting when we're hosting it, the village is hosting them. And instead of me having to get up there and welcome everyone to the village and tell them all these things, I could say, just watch this, guys. This, this is who we are. So if we have any, I hope we have no technical difficulties. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not, I'm just make, trying to make sure the sound's going to work, okay. too. Okay. You ready? Now, is that going to come up on our screens? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Let's, Richard had to make a quick run. We'll give him uh, a few minutes. He had a big goal. So. Uh, yeah, he did have a big goal. I don't know about anybody else, but that was not my favorite experience. Um, really? Except, you came except rank, no, he, man. he did. He did well with the conduct of it. But the, the one comforting thing was we pay him to make us look good. Exactly. Maintaining. Okay, was, take it from the wait, top. Well, my No, no, I paused. Oh, he's not back yet. I paused it. I think some of his comments we just can put in it a whole sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes. Here he comes. All right. Okay. You can watch on the big screen. That's okay. Yeah, I, 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 I you all can, if you want to go watch some big screen, that's yeah. okay. That's Feel free. That's Selena. Yeah. We work hard at maintaining what we call. What happened? He's going, what are you Thanks doing? Thanks for fixing the slide. We work hard at maintaining what we call the small town quality of life. Being here has a sense of safety in addition to hometown feel and place of belonging and connectedness. It's a family environment. It is that hometown feel. We do lots of community events. Royal Palm Beach has, has the feel of, of a, a wonderfully diverse community bring together a lot of people of a wide range of ages, uh, of interests, of backgrounds. This is a community where you can stay your entire life and never feel the need or want to, to leave the area. Well, for people who want to retire, 
in your senior years and have a, a beautiful parks to go to. Um, but at the same time, they can live close to the grandkids because this is also a place where young families can raise their children. Our first residents were seniors. There were individuals that were retired and looking for somewhere to move to, and they ended up moving into Royal Palm Beach. So they're really the heartbeat of our community. We have a unique selection of schools. We have seven schools here in Royal Palm Beach. And, and one of the really powerful things about our schools is that they're interconnected. We have what we call a continuum, a K through 12 continuum, which means simply that your, your son or daughter can actually get involved in some of these choice programs as early as the elementary school and wind up continuing along that academic track all the way through to graduation from high school. I love it here. You know, this is the best thing I've ever been to. It's a quality good time. I love it. At the end of the day, when we're done working, we want to go home and we want to engage in other activities. It's where we go to our community for parks and, and art and coming together and festivals and and enjoying each other's company. One, two, three. Royal Palm Beach Commons Park. Happy 4th of July! The events we have during the year at Commons Park, which is our signature park in the village, uh, it, it's open to, to all the, the residents. There's no fee for them to attend these events. Um, and we have different activities that these events designed for their children. And activities that these events designed for for the adults as well. So it's it's, it's going there and and having what we call a family venue or family entertainment. Living out here, it's only 20 minutes from downtown. You can hop on either the Turnpike or 95 and be wherever you want to go. It also is a community that has 18 miles of canals. It's a great place to have a home on on a body of water for the views. We do have a very safe community. That's the number one job of, of government, um, to keep the people safe. Maintaining the safety in this village is the most important job I think we have, and we, we, we are focused and we continue to focus on that. Royal Palm Beach is in the top 10% of safest cities in all of the state of Florida. Royal Palm Beach is an amazing place to open up a business. This is a great place to have a business, particularly a small business. We have small locally owned and operated businesses. Uh, we also have international companies like Aldi uh, Food Corporation, which has a, a regional distribution center and uh, office here in, in Royal Palm Beach. Uh, we have a lot of possibilities for future growth and development economically and through businesses. In my opinion, the future of Royal Palm Beach is staying the steady course, offer programs that our residents want, being friendly to businesses when they come through so we can continue to thrive. I think the future of Royal Palm Beach is excellent and very bright. Share any comments, Elliot? No. You sure? <laughs> Elliot Cohen is is the producer, director, editor of the of it, and it, I thought it came out great when we watched it the other day. And as you see, we ended it with the the 60th on there. Um, we are working with the town crier on that, and there will be an excerpt in the in the newspaper in the next few months. Uh, we are going to celebrate our 60th June 30th between four and seven at the cultural center. Everyone is invited. The whole 38,000. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, no further business before the council. We're, this, is, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>